Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us on Midday Live. And it's coming from Adisawe here in Accra. So for the next hour, we'll bring you some local international. And Nanekui Asari will join me with the very latest in business. And Joela Champon, of course, will join us with the very latest in sports. Now let's look at our headlines. And Pope Benedict slips quietly from the world stage after eight years as leader over a billion Catholics and traders at Medina Zongo Junction appeal to La Nkwantan Medina Municipal Assembly to ensure upcoming decongestion exercise is conducted in fairness. Stay with us for the details. Hello again, thanks for joining us in our very first story. Pope Benedict slips quietly from the world stage today after eight years as leader over a billion Catholics. Benedict used his weekly general audience on Wednesday to bid an emotional farewell to more than 150,000 people who packed at St. Peter's Square to cheer for him and wave signs of support. Now, once the chair of St. Peter is vacant, cardinals who have assembled from around Around the world will begin planning the closed door conclave that will elect his successor and joining me on the line now is the Ghana the president of the Ghana Catholic Bishops Conference Bishop Joseph Osaibon so good afternoon sir thank you for joining us thank you well I want to believe did you get the opportunity to meet the uh, the, the the Pope personally yes I did how would you describe him it's a very uh, quiet, humble person. I used to belong to a commission in a, before he became Pope, and he um, was always at the meeting and uh, was very unassuming and very humble. Mm -hmm. Right, and from that personal point and the world stage, what would you say would be his legacy that he's leaving to the rest of the world? Well, he was a theologian and a philosopher. He had been a professor of theology before he became Pope. And so he'll be remembered for his writings, and uh, the books that he wrote, and uh, the papal and secret house that he wrote, and that will be his legacy. Mm. Right. And how would you say his eight-year reign impacted on the lives of Catholics, especially the, uh, the, the challenges that confronted him, you know, the Catholic uh, the scandals that uh, sort of bedeviled the Catholic Church? Well, the challenges were there, and he did his best to, uh, to deal with them. And so they have to commend him for uh, for taking a strong stand in against uh, some of the challenges of our times. Right. Would you say Ghana really benefited, impacted uh, from his teachings? Yes, and how so? The writings so? are well known, well distributed, and uh, Ghanaians also will benefit from his writing, from his uh, papal encyclicals. Right, right. Will there be any special ceremony that the, uh, the, the Ghana, the Catholic Church in Ghana will be perhaps uh, c conducting? Well, we are asking all our members uh, to pray for the Pope and for the College of Cardinals on Sunday, uh, this coming Sunday. So we pray for the Pope to have a peaceful retirement and then also for the College of Cardinals to be enlightened by the Holy Spirit so they can choose at the right person for that work. Right. Thank you very, very much. And that was Joseph Saibonsu. And the Pope Benedict wrote quite a number of books, uh, stretching from classic introduction to Christianity in 1968 to the final installment of his church in on Jesus Christ. And we'll move on to other stories now. And traders at the Medina Zongo Junction have appealed to the Lao Kwantan Medina Municipal Assembly to ensure the intended decongestion exercise is conducted in fairness. They contend previous exercises had failed because of the Assembly's inability to ensure strict compliance, a report by Peter Kwao Adato. The Lankwantanan Medina Municipal Assembly has fixed Sunday, March 3, 2013, for the decongestion. 
Traders were aware of the intended action. I'm ready to move because it is not safe here. My only plea is that they should not demand outright payment for whatever place is prepared for us. Saturday will be our last day here. We have prepared a place to relocate. Trading here is highly risky. There must be a market day for wherever they are sending us to promote business activities. The assembly assured us of a place for 1,500 CDs per shed. There is a need to deposit 500 CDs. We are ready. We will not accept any situation where others will be allowed to do business here after we have left. The assembly should support us with adverts to promote business at the new site. Others fear the new road markets could not accommodate them. I saw phones. The place is not good for this business. There is no station to attract attention. The assembly should zone us into identical groups. We footwear dealers need a separate market. At least more than 20 years on the street is enough for us to know the market trend. But the assembly says they are not going back on their word. Assembly doesn't allow anybody there. It's very unfortunate that uh, it has been in the public domain that maybe the assembly is allowing some people to come or they are selective. It, it is, there is nothing like that. And this exercise that we are going to undertake this weekend is going to be the final one. And we'll make sure that nobody, I repeat it, nobody comes back to Rosad and sell. Because if anybody is to visit either the minister, the president, or whoever, any dignity is to visit the assembly, it's going to go through that route. And there's no way we can also allow them to be selling there. So this time around, they are going for good. And we'll make sure we are just going to monitor it 24-7. No single trader will be by the Rosad. So for quite some time now, TV3 has been bringing, you know, buildings that have defect in them and pose as a danger. And today we'll bring you another one. Now, three units, classroom block at Akutia in the upper Manya Krobo district of the eastern region has collapsed. For the second time, the situation has left pupils and teachers in fear. Construction kicked off over a decade ago. Lack of funds, however, ended any chance of completion. Parts of the three-unit classroom block have been supported to stay firm. Apart from the dilapidated classroom block, residents say water from boreholes in the community is salty. They would rather drink from Voter Lake that surround them, but would have to walk 10 to 15 kilometers depending on which side of the community one is commuting from. To assess health care, except on market days, residents would have to walk 21 kilometers to assess a work government hospital due to the poor state of the road. Teachers who commute to school daily opt for motorbikes since commercial vehicles ply only on market days. Commercial pedestrians and commercial vehicles and private car occupants are constitute the top three road users at risk in the greater Accra region. The acting regional commander of the National Road Safety Commission, Rudolf Beckley, made this known at a meeting with transport unions and operators in Accra. The meeting was to address the capacity of transport operators and the union with a view to reduce road accidents as 80% of mobility is by public transport. The acting regional manager of the commission, Rudolf Beckley, said poor regulatory framework surrounding the transport industry was hampering the work of the National Road Safety Commission, suggesting proliferation of transport union as worrying. Currently, the top three road users at risk include pedestrians, 
who stand the risk of 54.6%, followed by bus occupancy, 14.5%, and regular car occupancy, 15.4%. Bus occupants fatality in the Greater Accra region stands at 19.4%, which the acting regional manager of the commission described as alarming. Rudolph Beckley noted the region seeks to stabilize the trends in persons killed and seriously injured by 10% in 2015 and 50% by 2020. The acting regional manager told participants LI2180 of the regulatory framework stressed the need to employ the services of road safety officers at various lorry parks. A roundtable discussion has been held in Accra to implement a model for the National Youth Parliament. Government committed itself to institute a National Youth Parliament to promote youth representation and participation in decision making. The National Youth Parliament will be a platform for the youth to participate in decisions that affect their development. It will be non-partisan and would provide avenues for young people to have a voice in governance. Since the inauguration of the National Youth Consultative Forum in 2011 to constitute the Youth Parliament, some challenges have hindered its progress. Well, funding is a major challenge. Selection and representation to the Parliament is also another challenge because as I said we already have the student youth parliaments but the students are not representative of the whole cross-section of the youth in the country I'm hopeful that now that His Excellency John Dramani Mahama has his light shining on the youth I think that um, is a step in the right direction the youth parliament would have a fair representation of a cross-section of the youth both educated and non-educated Calling for a national youth parliament is in a way asking for an increased participation of the youth in the democratic governance of the country. Participatory governance has a good side. We also recognize that, yes, we have to work on the capacity of the youth so that they could have meaningful engagement. So it's not only one side to say we need a parliament, we need a parliament. But we take a step back build the capacity of the youth, let them understand the issues, then we create a platform for them to make their career and be part of the decision-making processes. The Minister of Youth and Sports, Elvis Efri Ankra, pledged to formulate policies for the implementation of the youth parliament. The youth have a responsibility to themselves and to society to be useful and productive citizens. Indeed, government as a responsibility to provide the necessary conducive and congenial environment. It means that we must begin to prepare and position ourselves for the responsibility that is coming. Most African countries are unlikely to attain Millennium Development Goal 1 in eradicating extreme hunger and poverty by 2015. Food security experts believe a shift from large-scale food production to producing food which with adequate nutritional supplement to combat cases of child undernutrition would improve coverage. In 2000, a set of eight poverty-busting goals were designed to significantly reduce global poverty and disease by 2015. The first of the eight is on eradication of extreme hunger and poverty. It is estimated that about 1.4 billion people around the world are living in extreme poverty and nearly one in seven people goes to bed hungry every night. Food experts have convened a meeting in Accra to study the causes of hunger in Africa. Food security is still a big issue on this continent in a number of countries and it's an issue that we as African Union have developed strategies to address. We're not where we need to be. They contend a shift from the traditional way of producing on large scale to a more conscious way of producing 
producing food with adequate nutrition could be a remedy. Some countries are making significant progress in uh, achieving MDG1 that relates to uh, reducing hunger, but the progress is not enough for a number of countries to achieve the target. We're working hard to ensure that all of the countries are able to achieve the MDG goal. Head of Research and Statistics Unit of the Ministry of Health, Dr. Reginald Odai, noted Ghana's significant strides at reducing hunger. As a country, hunger and undernutrition have no place in our growing democracy. And we hope that this landmark study will help us engage in more public discourse about the true cost of hunger and the concrete steps that we can take to make our country hunger free. Right, we'll go to a story that has generated a lot of attention. And the financial court trying businessman Alfred Agbesi Woyemi this morning was compelled to discontinue trial because the recording machines broke down. Former governor of the Bank of Ghana, Van Leer Dosu, was testifying when the machines stopped, resulting in an adjournment. The trial judge, Justice Nassem, told the court he wanted the case to be recorded all the time. Prosecution, led by state attorney Cynthia Lamte, this time managed to secure the services of a witness. Former, former governor of the Bank of Ghana, Van de Su, was in the middle of giving testimony when suddenly the recording machines stopped. This was a third time that morning, having ceased working on two occasions in previous cases. Quite surprisingly, a number of state actors stormed at the financial court while the case was being heard. These include the Attorney General, Madame Marietta Brew, and the Solicitor General, Barbara Ama Gezi. Woyemi had in recent times complained that there was no commitment on the part of the state to prosecute the case. He asked prosecution to throw in the towel if they have no evidence against him. Alfred Agbesi Woyemi is standing trial for defrauding the state by false pretenses when he allegedly misrepresented documents leading to the payment of 51 million Ghana City as judgment debt. He has pleaded not guilty and is on bail. deliver the state of nation address last week and just yesterday the minority NPP also delivered their version of the state of nation address which they term the true state of nation address today we ask you what your own assessment is with regard to the state of the nation after listening to the accounts of the two leading political parties what do you think state of the nation address is being given by the president alone not that the opposition party should come in and then give another um, comment about what the state of the nation is. The opposition is trying to put something like that is what they assume, which uh, is like a political battle. What MPP did is in the right direction. This will enable the government to learn something from the MPP if they are able to do things very well. Because at the end of the day, we Ghanaians are feeling the pinch. I think it's a good thing for the opposition to also bring their state of the nation and so that we can compare and know what is good or what is bad. By the opposition, they are bringing that so that we also go and do research and get to know what we can get from the two. We have water problem, you know, electricity problem, problem with gas. And so my advice to President Mahama you know, is to sit up and get all this uh, resolved as soon as possible. You know, if it's to make uh, a meaningful impact on our lives as, as a people. I don't know who is telling us the truth, uh, especially with regards to the energy issue. Um, I was of the opinion, I don't know whether somebody somewhere is trying to hide something from us that we don't know the true state of the problem that we are having as a nation now. Today is that, another day is there, so I'm even confused.
My name is Nanika Sari. This afternoon we'll be looking at more issues with regard to employment that is precisely on labor. Some concerns being raised by President Mahama and some more stories. Once again, thanks for joining us quickly to our very first story. Government intends to broaden the tax net to rope on all non-registered taxpayers. Minister of Employment and Labor, Niyama Ashite, made this known at a meeting with the leadership of the Trade Union Congress in Accra. The meeting was to brief the minister on current situations on the labor front. Leadership of the Trade Unions Congress expressed concerns about youth unemployment and numerous strike actions. We strongly believe that if we want to really ensure industrial harmony, the national apartheid activities and its functions should be made to work in a way that can really promote a very healthy relationship between the social partners, government as an employer, uh, employers and also unions. Indeed, government has to really take the lead with the kind of interventions that can really deal with job creation. The TUC again called for adequate resources for institutions such as the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission to help achieve their mandate in implementing the single spine salary policy. The sector minister, Ni Amashite, promised to ensure tax net was broadened to generate more revenue for the country. In, uh, in Ghana, very few people are carrying the burden of payment of taxes. And therefore, uh, we want to look at the, 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 the informal sector and see how we can get people within the informal sector to also uh, pay their, their taxes. Because it's a civic responsibility that everybody must pay taxes. The minister assured government was determined to reduce unemployment. We work, work together, I mean, with all the social partners, uh, the uh, labor unions, and then employers, so that together we can fashion our policies that will help move the ministry uh, uh, forward. The important thing is about creation of jobs. I mean, we supposed to coordinate all issues on employment and labor matters. And we're supposed to promote uh, uh, the environment to create jobs. Right, and we're still talking about issues on labor. And President Mahama, in his State of Nation address last Thursday, said personal and monuments portion of the budget has tripled in the last three years from 2.5 billion Ghana cities to 7.5 billion Ghana cities. Now he noted Ghana now spent a staggering 60.9% of its entire national revenue to pay public sector salaries. Concerns have been raised of course about the level of productivity of public sector workers and amount of pay they get and this afternoon i have on phone a labor consultant and also a former deputy minister of employment austin gummy great to have you this afternoon sir afternoon right now president the president has said that the meat is now down to the bones and it is time for serious rethinking about the level of wages and in, in relation to our uh, national competitiveness and also related issues related with productivity for the private sector salary now when we talk about salary rationalization it was to enhance fairness productivity and of course motivate workers but in your own opinion do you think that we have failed in the area of ensuring productivity yes thank you i i think that uh it's just that the reality is dawning on all of us, uh, and we have to take the bull by the horn at this point in time. There's no time for delay mm. any longer, and uh, any any attempt to delay a little bit can lead us into paralysis. So the wise thing to do is for us all to accept the reality, and labor management cooperation must be the order of the day. So that we can sit together and talk because without talking there will be no solution and and we have to get together talk about the issue and agree that indeed uh, the reality is that we are not uh, there yet uh, as far back as 1997-98 when we uh, were drafting the labor act we recognized that there will be the need to include uh, productivity matters as a matter of uh, uh, reality. And so I recall very well that I inaugurated the committee 
uh, that was both national uh, in character to develop a system that will be beneficial to all of us. Okay. The same, uh, the same, the chairman of the committee, now late uh, engineer Amwa, uh, happened to be the same person who led the the productivity movement and plan for Botswana. So we brought in a Ghanaian, and uh, together with neighbor and employers, we agreed and developed the plan, which was ready uh, to go along with the coming into force of the new Labour Act. Unfortunately, to date, it has never seen the day of light. And what and is so the way forward with that? That what you way, just mentioned. The way forward is to update it and uh, agree as a matter of agency. Uh, to have it nationally and and uh, uh, business specific uh, uh, implemented. Right. Indeed, to be honest with you, if it is if productivity is not brought to the first front of any organisation, you can forget about it. Nothing will work. Mm. Now, Mr. Gabi, when you look at the figure President Mahama mentioned, it's sixty point nine percent of its entire national revenue to pay public sector salaries. Now, one question that is battering minds are we really getting value for money from our public and civil servants from where i sit the honest admission is that even in most of the private sectors and of course more so in the public sector we do not have value for money because the management uh, uh, productivity systems if you like performance management systems that are to be put in place are just not in place. I can count on my finger mm. is the number of even private companies that have it. And therefore, it is very critical that we put together uh, a very important document we want to call uh, 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 performance management system and have all the relativities that are to go with it in place as and as agently as possible so that I'm not saying that what I should come agently means have hazardly done. We have experts in this country that can assist in okay. doing it so that we do not delay and have it done now because time is running out and the water will cover our heads. Well, you, you've agreed we're not really getting value for money. Let's look at how we should undertake performance with regards to paying you for the work you do. How do you expect it to be done? Yes, like I said, if we have the performance management plan okay. properly put in place, mm. the organization or the department will be no do know that this is the assignment they have to undertake, the objectives that have been set for them, the goal we are expecting from them, we give them all the tools and the training and everything is in place. Now, you have to ensure that you give each of the various units or sections their targets and every each and every individual just as you are speaking to me now that will be your assigned tax what? just as it's even in the labor act already so that everybody is given his due to be able to achieve that particular target if you don't achieve it there is a performance appraisal system which will form mm. part of the overall performance management system so we are praise you and we we'll know whether you are achieving the task along the line within okay. the, the, the 12 uh, month uh, uh, period there will be a lot of these things that to be put in place as a way of measuring and giving you an indicative rating to know that you are not reaching there mm -hmm. at the end of the, 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 the we shouldn't be paying people across board at the end of the month everybody the lazy person the average person and the hard working person are all pay the same pay increase it is demotivating enough for me to also become like the lazy person so everybody will be given an assigned role if you perform well and you got excellent there is a differentiated pay system that must be in place so that the person who works hard will be rewarded for his services but if you don't perform very well there should be a way of assisting you in putting you in a performance improvement plan kind of scheme uh, for a period of months. If you are not able to improve, you get out from the system. So the labor law allows that, you know, so that we ensure that we have value for money. 
not game as usual that everybody just woke up back and go to the workplace and the assigned role that have been given you don't perform it and engage in frivolous and endless conversations that are not productive and helpful to the company this is what we have got into and it's about time we shake ourselves from this kind of strange phenomenon that has over over covered cover this now in this country then then so it means that we are really debunking the school of thought that increased salary or increased pay for all workers is the best option out it means that is the only option it means that is not the only option out out of that listening to what you've just said about the whole topic yes that is not the, the as for pay increase mm. it might be done to motivate people to do more people might be challenged to do more so if you are a hard worker you must be seen being given more if you are an average worker you get average pay if you are uh, uh, just uh, an underperformer, you get zero. <laughs> but to, to lump everybody into the same uh, kind of bracket and pay everybody a 15% across board pay is an old junk arrangement that have been put in place many, many, many centuries ago. Okay. And in this postmodern world today, it is not wise to do that anymore. Okay, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. So I'm sure that they would want to pick some cue from the private sector because most of the private sector companies have adopted this particular target thing that you're really talking about. Thank you, Mr. Austin Gami, Labour Consultants, for your time this afternoon. We continue and let's look at some international news now. European Union officials have struck a provisional deal on new financial rules, including capping bank bonuses, and that the agreement's bonuses will be capped at a year's salary but can rise to two years pay if there's explicit approval from shareholders now the uk which hosts europe's biggest financial services center was opposed to any caps on bank bonuses uk prime minister david cameron said the eu should concentrate on fighting up banks in other ways